Welcome to Making Interactive NFTs. I'm Dr. Abstract. All right, uh, let's take a look at one of our latest ones here. It's called Interface, and we have it open. And as you press different things, play around with the interface, I don't know if you can tell what's happening. It's not too much, but it's a light bit of interactivity. Ah, yes, it's starting to see it. You see around the edges, our wires are getting to have colors. Uh, they have colors. <laughs> there we go. So uh, let's do a refresh on this. If I refresh, we'll get a different interface. There they are. Sometimes they're, this looks like a horizontal layout. This is a mix of random. Oh, three vertical layouts. So we're adjusting the rarity so that these things happen more often. Uh, first of all, each batch of them, so there's a grid of nine really, each batch could have up to nine different types of interfaces. Uh, that just is coincidence. Um, but it's handy because one of the things that we do sometimes is show, let's see if we can get one, we sometimes show one of each. Uh, oh, look at that one. So here's all the same. Normally, obviously, that would, would not happen very often. But what we've done is we've made it half the odds. If we get a row or a column, we've made it half the odds that we're going to get the same row. Half the odds again that we get the same row. That is if we've, we've gotten the odds for three rows or three columns. Oops. <laughs> Well, either, either rows or columns. I think I was indicating rows there, but uh, or indicating columns, but saying rows. Uh, here it is. Okay, so this is one where we have one of each. So that happens as well. So we played with the odds so certain ones will will turn up. Uh, that's a little bit different, isn't it? Um, there's all of them again. That's it. Looks like one row. So when we say one row, or <laughs> my rows and my columns oh my god when i say one column that's a column i can do it uh, when we say one column we put it in the middle if there's that's one column as well that's one column as well this is two columns one two so if we have two columns then we put them on the sides uh, that's that's all of them and it'll do rows as well. So there's a row. Yay, a row. Woohoo. So one row goes across the middle. Two call. Oh, wait a second. That's a weird one, isn't it? Ooh, that would be really rare. Because this is one column. But the other left-hand column happened to be three of the same as that. So, uh, oh, and these two, uh, it's close. It's like I just sort of threw an odd one in. We were thinking of doing that. Like a thing of, okay, make it perfect, but then just toss an odd one everywhere. But we didn't do that. That's not one of the settings. So what this setting is, one column, and it happens to be these other, wow, it's almost like a Yahtzee. Those other ones are, are random out of the nine, all showing sliders. And that's two columns, three columns, you get the idea that would be random. So this just happened to be random everywhere. This is one row. Random everywhere. Three columns. And nope, that's everywhere different. So everywhere different. Well, it could be random everywhere, but unlikely. That's everywhere different. Two uh, rows, one column. Okay, so I think you get the idea, huh, in general. So it's those, I think, six settings that we had. Make it random, put one in each place, uh, rows, calls, or rows and calls, or something like that. Anyway, roughly that. All right, let's reduce this down. We're uh, using Zim, zimjs.com, to make this NFT. You can come here and check it out. Under, where do we put that these days? We, this used to be called Zim NFT. Well, uh, before that, it was Zim 10. No, Zim Cat, Zim, Zim 10, Zim Neo, Zim Oct, etc. So we've had lots of versions of Zim. Zim NFT was one of them. And here is the news for when it was NFT. Uh, we presented a special page, like it was a, a front sort of banner that would lead you to this page of how to make NFTs with Zim. And indeed, there's the uh, ones for FX hash, and this one was built for FX hash. 
I'm a member of the Gadget Minters, and you're welcome to join us. It would be good. And maybe we can, like, share each other's or uh, collect each other's. I guess that's how we're going to collect and share. All right, so just contact me there on Facebook or... Oh, that's, uh, you know, uh, Discord or Slack's probably best. to Contact me on Discord or Slack. I'd love to see you. So there's some information about making NFTs with Zim. We are going to use a template, which comes from the code page here. We've basically copied this template. Actually, if you go make an NFT for Tezos, that is for FX hash or Hicket Nunk like things like Tia or OBJKT.com, uh, there are templates available for those back on that NFT page. So you can grab that template. Uh, the template looks something like this. Actually, did I upload the template or update the template? I better make sure I updated that. But here we are uh, in a folder called Interface. <clears throat> oh, yeah, we got some noise that we're putting over top of that just to make it look a little bit noisy. That's the only image. And then here are, are some pics that we took of those interfaces, but we didn't upload them. We just use that for various promotional things or galleries, etc. Uh, and then here's our scripts. So this would be in the template. We're using Zim version zim00 and there's the minified script of that as well as CreateJS, which is what zim's built on here's the index page that we're looking at and then we've zipped up these guys except for the pics we've zipped them up and that's what we post up to fx hash there's a video on that whole uh, system on how to go through and do that so that's on that nft page zimjs.com slash nft in here we have the fx hash code so over over here is you know what it's showing uh, when we load it uh, we have a video we'll post a link to it in this video a video showing you through what the fx hash code is doing as well as how we work with rarity so zim we've got a rarity uh, function that we can call and then let's see here we're doing some special things with it so we'll probably look through those special things to to show you how we set those odds so that we would get proper repetitions with it, it we were only doing i think um, 30 of these maybe 40 of these it did sell out which is nice but we wanted to make sure that we got some really exciting ones in that small number so that's uh, one of the primary reasons i'm taking you through this is to see how we did that but I'll, um, we'll do that later. Let's just get a lay of the land here. And then FX hash, we send, so the focus was a quad. What was the quad doing? Quad is, that's the focus. Oh, right, a quad, so there's four things. So it's either dispersed, it's random. Dispersed means it's um, all, all uh, nine of those things is different. Random is it's just random. So uh, it's more likely that there will be a vertical setting or a horizontal -like setting. And then we're going to see, we're going to affect the vertical and horizontal differently there. So anyway, those are the, the four settings there. But within that, we've got um, the adjustments here. Those adjustments will actually um, set conformity. So there are nine different conformity settings. And uh, we'll go through those in a bit. And then we have whether or not this is turned on. So at the moment, this one is not turned on. How about that? This is at one. These ones are all at zeros. That's at zeros. So and, and the, the um, progress bar is not spinning. So if I refresh this, there's the progress bar spinning. We've got now random. So it's more rare that it, it won't be or it's more yeah more rare that it won't be turned on so uh, it's a lot more likely that it will be turned on and the odds there is a nice simple odds so there's an 80 percent chance zim's got this thing called odds basically what this says is it's true if it's bigger than 80 percent okay a random number is bigger than 80 percent we also have a random number called rand but this makes it a little bit simpler and if it's on then uh well, if it's greater than 80%, then it's on. I can't remember if it, I think it's greater than, not greater than, equal to, whatever. Uh, right, okay, down here we have the Zim frame. And we can get into that too to find out how we made, there's the wires. Here's some 
backing rectangles that all these interfaces are going to go on. We're using style, and then we make the, but the different types of interfaces, uh, or we prepare them, and then we uh, make a, I guess that's it right there, we just tile whatever we did. So we'll, we'll go through that, and when we click on it, we're adjusting the wires. These were, if on, oh, after we've made all the interfaces, if we're turning them on, what this is doing is it's looping through whatever interfaces we made and turning them on in a various way. That's the noise pick. And then after a certain amount of time, we do an FX preview. All right, so that's the lay of the land there. Okay, <laughs> there we're done. Yay, now you can do it too, right? That's it. That's how we made it. <laughs> nah, we'll, we'll go a little more in-depth than that. <laughs> Hopefully that's okay with you. So popping back up, we have done, like I said, a video on how to use Rarity. But since this specifically deals with um, a sort of an adjustment or a, a kind of hard-coded, well, not a hard-coded, but a specialized version of it, we're going to be dealing in this area Anyway, so I may as well just go over it briefly. Uh, Rarity is basically saying there's a five. Well, you would add up these numbers. Usually I make those numbers add up to 100, but they don't have to. It's just saying five out of 30. So, yeah, they add up to 30. Five out of 30 it will be this chance. Five out of 30 will be that chance. 10 out of 30 that one. 10 out of 30 that. All right. Um, and then down below, we'll see what these really mean when we go to use them. And then we've got a set of, these are Zim components, some of them anyway. We've got oh, 50 components, something like that, 30, 40, 50 components. And these are some that we have chosen to add to this art piece. It's kind of questionable if you were to do this and, and uh, this was your art, then it's, it's okay. Uh, but me, uh, making Zim, <laughs> I figure these components are as much as my art <laughs> as any other of my art. So, uh, however, if you were basing it on just sort of randomizing some components like this, you might want to consider talking to me about it. Maybe we could collaborate on it. Or, uh, But I, I expect... Certainly, if you would use any of the components in your art, that's fine, or in your games, no problem. That's, of course, expected. <laughs> but if your art is really solely the components, <laughs> might have been another might have been another case. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? Uh, anyway, no big deal. Um, but those are the different Zim components. If focus is equal to dispersed, we're going to shuffle those types. So we just shuffle it and the order. It looks like we're going to use an order down below. So order is going to be an array in the order that we want. This is the first one here, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay, so we'll, we'll then tile that order and that's what tile will just make that order for us. So if it happens to be dispersed, we're, we're done. We just have to shuffle this thing and it will the order would, it would just be that shuffled. Well, not that, but each individual one, each of these shuffled. If uh, else, we're, we're preparing our order down here. We're going to build our order. Let's collapse this one. So if the focus is not random, then we're doing all this stuff in here. And where does that go to? I don't know. <laughs> Should have... Looks like it collapsed my last bracket. So that bracket to that bracket, yeah. So we'll take a look at this afterwards because that's sort of the more complex one. But we're basically saying if we're not, if we're not random, do this stuff. Else, if there's any left over, so what this is going to do is be it's going to be placing stuff in in some sort of order in order. So it's adding to order, you see, where is it doing that? Uh, order at zero is equal to it. So we're setting um, down in here, if we're horizontal or vertical, we're setting certain ones together. And the idea is we would add certain ones to order, 
Then when we come down here, we're looping nine times, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And if there isn't already something in order, then we're going to pluck something from the types. So pluck is a, a Zim function that just grabs a random element from an array. <laughs> we used to do that for many, many years with Zim. Uh, we used to do that by shuffling and grabbing the first one. Um, of course, you can do it with raw JavaScript by just getting a random number between zero and then the length minus one, and then asking for the array element at that, but that's a little bit more lengthy. So we introduced just recently, as a matter of fact, as we got lazy, as we started working more with generative art, it's very common to, to grab a random element from an array. Well, actually, it's fairly common throughout whether you're working with generative art or not. And we were annoyed that there was no easy way to do that. Even with PHP, by the way, there's not like a, there's a kind of easy way. They have rand array or something like that. And all that does is it gets them in an index number that is random of the, you know, the length of the array minus one. It doesn't actually get you the final object from the array. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Anyway, pluck gets you that final object. You can also pass in a true here or a false. I can't remember which one it is. As I said, it's, it's kind of new if you want to actually remove it. So currently it doesn't remove it from the array unless you pass in true, at which point it will pull it out of the array. Okay. Um, uh, but here we're basically saying if there's an empty spot, then fill it with a random number. So if you think about it, if, if, if we're not, if we, if we want full random, and we're not going in here, we're not adding anything to the array. Basically, we've got an empty order. So this is just gonna put a random number in everything. So that's fine, okay. It will randomly fill that with, um, with these guys. So it could be two buttons, then a slider, then a dial, then an indicator, then two pads or whatever. All right, so here's where a bit of the art is coming in then. If it's not random, then we're either horizontal or vertical. All right, so if we come in here, we're going to pull a random number. So there's the Zim rand that gets a random number between zero and one, not including one. So it works just like math.random. Uh, Zim rand is a little bit better when you say, hey, give us, a, that's a random number between zero and 20 integer, but you can tell it not to be an integer with other parameters there. Uh, or perhaps even better between 10 and 20. So now that's the Zim rand between two values. Uh, and then there's another parameter for um, whether you want that to be an integer and then another one saying whether you want the negative range as well. So this is true if it's an integer or null or undefined. And then if you say um, true here, that would mean it would be a random number between minus 20 and minus 10 or minus 10 to 20 any, any, in any of those ranges. So that's the Zim rand. Oh. Uh, we're just pulling a random thing here because we're, we're going to get thirds basically. So if the random num, oh, if R, well, I don't know what that one's for. Maybe that was just for if it's vertical or horizontal and we get to that later. Um, anyway, R is another random number. If R is greater than 0 0.666, then we're going to make three sets. So there's a third chance that we're going to have three sets. Else, if it's greater than 3, 3, so there's another third chance we're going to have two sets. Else, there's a third chance we're going to get one set. So if we have three sets, then um, one is going to be a pluck of the types. So the very one on the left is just which type is it? Or well, randomly, it's going to be one of the uh, one of these types, say dials. Then two will be odds, just odds without anything in it is 50% odds. So that's half the time um, we're going to make two the same as one. So half the time it's gonna be the same as one. Otherwise, we're gonna pluck a new type, which actually means that it could actually then pluck the same type again. Never really thought about that. So there's a greater chance than half that it will be the same. Uh, no big deal. Um, Three, the same deal. So three, there's half a chance at three being the same as one. Now note that these two things are independent, so I don't know exactly what the odds are of having all three the same versus having this one be the same as that one is half the chance being the same as half of that. 
probably like a quarter of a chance then. Sounds like a quarter of a chance that you're all of them. So it's, uh, what? It, that is, if a uh, quarter of a chance it's all of them, if uh, there's, or sorry, a quarter of a chance they're all the same, if indeed that one third chance has said that we're going to be here. <laughs> right, whatever. So isn't that cool? Um, so we're just adjusting some things in there to really uh, have a chance at these being more similar within the lower number of additions. So if there's only two sets, that's we do the same thing with the two. And note that we haven't established horizontal or vertical yet, right? Because we're gonna we could use this for either horizontal or vertical, so that's been left over. I think that that's what that rand is, but we're not using that in here yet. If there's only one type, we, we just pluck it. Then we say, if the focus is vertical, I don't even know where we use that V. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was being used before we set the focus. Yeah, totally. So we're not even using the V there. Um, if the focus is vertical, so we, we went up, so we built this initially without having all of this other stuff around or these other things. Where do I have the focus? Oh, there it is. Dispersed. So yeah, the focus is going to be uh, either vertical or horizontal inside here because it's not dispersed. It's not random. So it's either vertical or horizontal. So if it's vertical, then if one, oh, so if there is a one and we're vertical, hmm, that's interesting. Oh yeah, two, yeah, two, you see. So if there's not three and there's not two, then we're actually filling the two column here. So that's right. Okay, so if there is a one, then we're making if this is vertical, 0, 3, and 6. So this is 0, 3, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So we're adjusting this column right here because we're vertical, and it'll be whatever it says is in 1. If it's 2, then we just shift over 1, and we're filling in that with 2, or we're filling it in with 3. Okay, so that's done for vertical for horizontal a little bit easier zero one two so zero one two and then if it's two it's three four five and if it's three then it's six seven eight there all right so that fills it in with whatever we need if we happen to have all three of them like if all three of them went then this whole thing's going to be filled and it won't there won't be any left over but if two of them did, then some of them are going to be left over, which we fill with random things. And that's how, that's basic coding, okay? There's not really too much zim going on there. We use some odds, we use some pluck, but you could have done that easily with code as well. So all this stuff is pretty well straightforward odds kind of coding. Nice. And then conformity, ah, this is a zim repeats. Repeats is a function. So repeats, odds. Uh, what was the other one? Repeats, odds, pluck, and rarity. Those four commands have been brought in place specifically because we found we need these kinds of things when we're preparing generative art for FX hash. Uh, they're useful in other types of things as well. It's just we decided to um, add some custom ones in there specifically for this generative artwork. So that's kind of neat. So what re, uh, what repeats does is it counts how many, what is the maximum number of repeats. So it's not all the repeats. So in other words, if we look at this one, these two repeat, but the maximum number of repeats here is three, one, two, three. So it would get back the answer of three. And that's what we're using for a rarity. If, uh, if these are indicators, if indicators were placed here, then we would have four, and four would be fairly rare, wouldn't it? Because we have columns that are duplicating. So if another column duplicated, then that would be a repeat of six or nine. So it's three, six, nine are going to be quite common. But anything off of three, six, nine, are, it, it's going to be more rare because that means you had, you know, you didn't fill up and you've got another match or two or however many 
one or two more matches would make that rare. Uh, so you can check out what happened there. What happened basically is saying the one with everything filled all the same isn't the rarest. <laughs> it's the sort of the off kilter ones that have most, well, not even most of them, but just a few of them the same off of, uh, off of the other norms, you know, the straight column repeats. So that's kind of cool. <clears throat> and there's where we're putting in the values. Uh, by the way, this one would work fine because we haven't used what's called a payload. So there's an option in here to use a payload, but we're actually, we, we don't mind. If it's dispersed, we're going to use the number, f uh, oh, we're just going to use the word dispersed. Yeah, so down here, here we are using dispersed, random, and vertical. So we're using the values, those same values. Often, though, we want to tell fx hash this information, but we don't want to use this information later in a look, you know, we want we want to use some value. These are the odds, so we're not going to use the odds. And if we want to use the value, then what we do is we pass a payload. So maybe dispersed would be 20 or something like that. Uh, there's 20 of them, or that's a distance in between. Uh, or if it was random, then, uh, I don't know, maybe rand uh, um, 20 would be in there. So now a random number of 20 would be in there. Uh, the other way you could do that instead of randomizing 20, you could also pass in a ZMV value with a min of, Z, well, or just a max, I guess, of 20. Okay, that would, that would be the same thing because these all accept what are called ZMV values, uh, or the payload does. And by the way, I'm working on the payload here. But anyway, some rand 20 would be fine. And if it were vertical or something, some extra information, this extra information we can send along to use. As a, as a payload property would be, I don't know, uh, 100. Okay, you, you get the idea. And then whichever one was picked, we do one more for horizontal, whichever one was picked, later we could ask for focus.payload and use that in our calculations down below. But as it turns out, we didn't have to have a payload. Um, in a sense, it's like a lookup table. It's a lookup table built right here rather than later. So later, you could have done the lookup table. Oh, if it's random, then choose this. If it's vertical, oh, then choose this. If it's dispersed, then choose that. So we could have had an extra lookup table later. It's just, uh, that's extra work. So we built the lookup table right in Rarity if you need it. In this case, we didn't need it. When there is a lookup table so that we can hold that payload. Ay, 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 what am I doing here? Uh, when there is a lookup table, in here or in the uh, payload that is, uh, and we want to use payload, what we had to do to hold the payload is focus, which is usually one of these words, isn't really a string. Well, it's not a string primitive anymore. It's a string object so that we can hold a payload property on it, focus.payload. Just focus is this as a string, or that is a string, that is a string. So what we found, and we mentioned this in another video as well, that describes all of this FX hash uh, stuff that we've made, or well, the, the rarity stuff that we've made, that's in the link down below. Um, what the issue was, uh, this FX hash feature is looking for primitives in here. So when we put the values in here, they need to be primitive. And they weren't <laughs> with with payloads. They were they were objects. We're going. So we, we asked FX Ash. Hey FX Ash. By the way, could you like just uh, you know can you uh, what's the word for it? Um, cast. Can you cast those as primitives? And they said, well, not really. <laughs> so we went okay. So before we were handling each one separately, and then we realized ah we should just do this thing called make primitive. So here's another thing that came about so that we could handle FX hash. Anyway, this make primitive, whatever we pass into that, it will turn all the values into primitives from the string literals or number literals, or sorry, number objects or string objects that we were using. Okay, so that's what the make primitive does there. And then we don't have to think about worrying about each one. In this case, we I don't even think we need it, but we may as well keep it there for the future. Future proofing. All right, good. Let's go in and take a look and see how we did the wires in the background. So you see those wires? We were going to use a picture of a wire, and we looked up wires, and we went, oh, come on, we're making generative art. It can't be that hard to make wires. Uh, you know, it, 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 
it, it would be kind of hard to make wires like all these wiggles. We've got this thing called a squiggle and we could make a bunch of squiggles and put them in there, but this would be a fair number of squiggles all with different, you know, Bezier kind of points and stuff. So we could have randomized the Bezier points and made a bunch of random squiggles. Hey, okay. But we cheated a little bit. Can you tell what we did? Not really, huh? We just made a bunch of circles of different sizes. And so that's what these wires are. There are a bunch of circles of different sizes in behind there. So here's wires. It's going to be a container. The reason why I'm making a container is when we add all the sight circles to it, later when we're clicking on things here, when we anytime we press down on this, you're going to see we just pick one from the container. It's easier if they're in a container, then we can just, hey, grab one of the ones in the container. So we've made this container of wires. We're looping 150 times. The other we can, other thing we can do with the container too is we can cache it. So that turns this as an image. Instead of having to keep track of all the vectors of this, it builds it. But then afterwards, every time we refresh the stage here, so as I'm moving this, it has to refresh the whole stage so that we can see that moving uh, or any of these other components. So... Um, no point in redrawing all these circular wires every time. If we can just cache it, then the GPU will handle it for us. So we've put all those circles in there, and then we cache it and set their alpha down. So here's what that looks like with uh, an alpha of 1. Okay, there are those wires. And if we... What can we do? We can comment out the rest of this. And that will show us our wires. So basically a bunch of circles in behind there. I'm sure you can figure out how to make circles, but let's have a look at what we do. We picked a random radius. And the reason why we did it this way, normally it's quite easy to make a random radius. We make a new circle and we could go like this. Min 10 max colon 20. So those are the Zim V values we mentioned. So whenever we made the circle, it would just pick a random, well, actually, since this is in a loop, it's no problem. Often, though, we pass circles into things like a tile. Tile the circle, please. And this allows us, we don't have a loop, so you know we can't be pulling different random numbers at the time. So this allows us to pass in a min and a max to the circle. And then whenever a circle is made, it will pick from that. So that's called Zim pick or Zim, we call it Zim V because it was introduced in the version 5v of zim very very handy we can do that uh we could pass in an array there and it would pick from the array we can pass in a function and it would pick from the results of the function uh, we could pass in um what else did we a series a series and then it would pick them in order anyway we could have also because this is in a um because this is in a loop we could have just run the random number right in there the reason why we didn't run the random number right in there, we started that way, is if you look closely at the wires, see that? It's actually a circle, it's two circles. The circle has a border on it, and it has a clear inside. So it's basically a border, and then another circle that's the same size with a thinner border. And that's what gives us the darkness around the edges of that. It's like kind of a ring with a border on each side, basically. And that has a nice wire look. Uh, let's just adjust this. So for the color, the same, same issue with the color, we could have passed the color in right here. So this is one of the colors. We're basically plucking one of the colors out of here, getting a random color. Okay, so red, green, blue, yellow, orange, or whatever. Okay, and what we're wanting to do is make the backing circle be darker and the top circle be lighter. So we're darkening this circle right here. We're darkening that, and we call that the shell. So we're darken. Zim's got a darken and a light, and you can take any color and darken it halfway to black or whatever proportion. Or you can lighten, or you can 
alpha two alpha as well. Uh, here's the second circle. We didn't even bother storing it in a variable. That's the second circle is the same radius. It's also clear, but it's the actual color that we've chosen. So normally we don't have to pluck these ahead of time, but we needed the radiuses to be the same between these two things, and we needed the colors to be the same between each of those things. If we wanted to, check this out. Um, so if we want to make a bunch of circles, plop, just get rid of that one. And then I can, instead of darkening it, I can just put that in there. So what I've done is put the colors, don't even need that. And same with this rand, we could have just, as I mentioned before, we could have handled that right inside of here. And then we'd be making a, a new circle. And as we pass the colors in, Zim V value, the random thing, would, would pick from, from the, the array, the random thing, or it could be a series. So there are just single circles, and note that it picks from those colors. If we wanted to pick from the colors every time we build in series, we won't be able to tell the difference because they're all randomly positioned there. So that would, every time we make a circle, it would pick red, then green, then blue, then yellow, then orange, then red, then green, then blue, then yellow. And we, like I said, we won't notice. Oh, we do. Why is that? It looked like it picked one from the series. Why was that? Huh. If I loop 150 times, oh, we keep on remaking the series. So at that point, you would pull the series out. Right. I'm as, sorry, I'm not used to using a series in a loop necessarily. You would pull the series out of the loop. I'm used to using a series in a tile when we pass, when we tile, or uh, not only just a tile, but also things like the emitter. If you want to emit colors in order, then you could pass in a series to the emitter. But we would pull the series out top here, and then each time we loop, it would pull it. Right now, each time we loop, we're making a new series. <laughs> uh, not what we intended. Okay, let's undo this anyway before we get too deep into it. Yeah, that's probably where we were. Okay, and we're we're using uh, shades of gray in a sense there. And then we will also, although we could have, you know, done hue saturation, whatever, and just done it that way. But we just plucked a few shades of gray in there for our wires. And then whenever we click on things, when we interact, you can't always tell because the circle that we're changing might be hidden in behind here, but uh, you know, people probably aren't really caring too much as they click more. I can start to see various circles are coming into color here and we'll see how we did that in just a sec. So that's the wires in behind. I think that's most of it. We located them randomly on the stage width, randomly on the stage height. This other one, we just locate at W for wire. This is the wire that we're making. So we made another circle, we located it at W. And that means we don't need to specify a Y. Normally it's an X and then a Y. There we are getting random stage width, random stage height. And we're making sure to add it to wires. So the third parameter of a loc is which container do we want to locate in? X, Y container. Uh, or um, what object do you want to locate it at? Any, or anything with an X and Y property. What If you want to locate it at that X and Y, just say it. And then we don't need to specify the Y. And then on wires. Okay, so Zim's got loc. We can locate things. We can center things. We can center reg them, which centers and register. Oh, here are centers, center reg. Uh, so these rectangles that we've made, which are this big and black and darker, probably could have made those a proportion of the of the stage width and stage height, but whatever, we hard coded them in there. Um, black and darker, so black is that outer rectangle and darker is the inner rectangle. We're centering that. Why did we not center either of them? What the heck is with the reg? Rotate pluck. Why do I care? I don't care. All that, I don't even know what uh, that was. Must have been left in from something else that we were doing. Oh yeah, I was I was uh, experimenting with a rectangle that was a gradient, 
at which point I just made the gradient and then rotated it around. So that randomized some gradient stuff. But we don't need that. So in that case, we center ridged. Um, so that as we rotated, it would rotate around the center. By default, Zim rectangles have their registration point top left corner. So if we rotated them randomly, it would spin around the top left corner, which we didn't want. So we center ridged. Anyway, we don't need that. And we don't need this as far as I know. Let's have a refresh. Yeah, that looks all fine. Ooh, those ones look cool, huh? All right. Um, here, we're applying style to some stuff down below here. So we have the types of, we have the types of um, components we're making here in types. But then what do we do? We set the order. So we're wanting to get these things from order. Okay. And then when do we use lookup? What the heck is lookup? So lookup, oh, we're making a lookup table. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to, at the names that we used, we're going to store in this object literal at dials a, a tile of dials. So there's a bunch of new dials. Note that we've got dial buttons, sliders. We're hardly doing anything to these. They're just the default components. The one thing that isn't default is the indicator should be interactive, but we could have even pulled that out right here and put it up in style. So I, I think it, it really doesn't matter. Everything can be interactive. Anything that has an interactive parameter, uh, we want to be interactive. So we could have just said interactive true. And then that would have been fine. We wouldn't have stored that in the indicator. Let's have a look. There's an indicator right up here. And indeed, we have styled anything that has an interactive property as being interactive. Checkbox is obviously interactive. The indicator by default is not interactive. We don't necessarily want people pressing on these little puny circles. So you have to turn that on specifically. The indicator is really just saying, hey, which, which, which one are you on? It's not really supposed to be used to go to one, but it can be if you so desire, At which point you might want to make them a little bit bigger. So anyway, look, defaults all the way through, bop, 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 bop of those things. This one's a little different. Most of them are tiles, 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 but the pad, which is this thing, is already really a tile of, well, you might think it's a tile of buttons, but it's not. It's a tile of tabs. So a line of buttons is, and tabs is a tile of buttons. Um, Anyway, so the pad's the only one that's different. All the rest of the oh, progress bar is just one big progress bar. We actually did put the progress bars in a, in a tile, and it looked okay. It wasn't too bad, but I thought it, it started to look a bit like the dials. So I thought, hey, let's make a big, just a single progress bar. We can concentrate that. And um, so we just passed in one rather than the tiles of each of these other things. All right, so a tile, by the way, is what object you want to tile, how many calls, how many rows, and the spacing horizontal, spacing vertical. So there we scaled the button a little bit smaller and tiled that two by five. There, here they are. Two by five, one, two, three, four, five. Sure enough, it is. Okay, and then the spacing between the buttons to get these roughly to be, you know, same size roughly. Here we are tiling the sliders. These are sliders. And the pad is mentioned, the check boxes. Oh, aren't we lucky? This happens to be one where there's one of each. So we can demonstrate each one. Those are check boxes. Here's a stepper. Steppers are can be numbers, but you can also put string steppers as well in there. And these steppers go to um, from zero. So see the grade out there. And I can press on this or press here, or I can drag that. And the farther away I go, the faster it goes. Nice, huh? So you can have a slow drag or even drag backwards. And same with here. You can drag up or drag down if you want to. And those are the Zim steppers. Or like I said, they could have text in there and then they work kind of like a pulldown. Um, nice, handy. They can 
also have sub like um, little arrows on the top and the bottom or have big arrows on the top and bottom little arrows on the side uh, but a secondary set of arrows to handle decimals if desired and they can wrap as well if, if, if you want these are the the dials which i suppose because we didn't look at the dials up here dials it's a dial basically same as a slider except slider does that and a dial does a dial there's also a dial that you can sort of go up and down with uh, like they do in music um, instruments or music uh, tools uh, whatever you call those recording tools and stuff there they you click on them and move up and down usually maybe left and right but up and down and we have a dial setting that's like that it's called sound true and it will style it with a an outline uh, that goes around the outside what do we call that a let's see well, you know what was that the this one has it as well an accent so when the line sort of fills up as you move and then it drains fills up drains uh, they both have accents. So you can style all these things. Speaking of style, we, ha we still haven't quite looked at the style up here. But uh, that's, I guess, good enough for this. This is called a D-pad, so it doesn't really do anything aside from when you click on it, it makes a wire. But normally, this is like, if you're on mobile and want to use keypad, you can't really. So on mobile, well, I mean, you can. You can bring up the keyboard or whatever but that sucks for a game so this is a d-pad replacement where you put your finger on there and go left and right you can lock in on on axes as well up and down or left and right or whatever anyway that's a d-pad to go everywhere and you put your finger on it and just sort of pull this way to move whichever way you want to go uh, like i said you can set it up horizontal vertical etc so those are the d-pads we talk about all of them I guess so. Okay, so we made a lookup table. And here, these will style as those things are made. So we're setting corners to zero, aligns to the center, V aligns to the center. On the dial specifically, we have a max and a min. Uh, probably could have set all maxes and mins. I'm not sure if anything, oh, well, uh, maybe the indicator has a max and min. Uh, maybe, no, I don't think so. I think there might have been some other component, like maybe this can has a, have a max and a min, that we didn't want to, to be affected. So we said specifically the dial, specifically the slider. So these are Zim styles, very much like CSS or the other way around, perhaps. CSS very much like object literals, um, which we've had coding for a long time. Here are buttons. So maybe I should move the buttons up there as well to be kind of next to those. And then all of these guys. So all of these, oh, that was an indicator. Okay, worked out well. All of these ones are general styles on everything. All these are, now we could move, just to be safe, I suppose, we could move the interactive true into here. So the indicators are interactive true in case we didn't want other things to be interactive true. Blobs and squiggles are an example of other, other things that are usually interactive, but we can turn them off if we want to. Uh, so that wouldn't have worried because we were setting it to true regardless. But whatever, there's stuff in, in indicators. With style as well, uh, the thing that we're missing that you might think, what about uh, classes? Here are saying what types of objects will get that. That would be like saying all paragraph tags have this style. But we can also do classes as well. We call them groups instead because in coding, we use the word class, so it got confusing. So we call them groups, and if you wanted to, we can set up groups. So group, I guess groups like that. Um, it might be just single, let's see. Yeah, I think these are all the groups. And then you can call it something, I don't know, like big or whatever you want to call it. We'll get these styles. And then when you create a, a button or something, you would say uh, group like that big so string big so this the buttons then would be a part group big and then here we've got big and let's just um set the color that would be the front of it color to red do we have another color anywhere 
no. Okay, so that'll probably do it. Let's see if it works. We have an error, oh, comma. We still have an error. So comma there. Did I add another thing? Ah, oh, there. I swapped the order of these things, didn't I? There we go. You were probably looking at that going, oh, you, you, comma, your comma is missing. And so now these buttons have a color of red because each button that gets made happens to have that group, <laughs> uh, which is okay. All right, or we could override it on the individual basis, just like CSS would override. Anyway, I don't want that group. I do want a delete. And we don't want to make that a group. Of thick. And you can have multiple groups in the same thing if you want. With commas. And we're back to presumably oh, no buttons. There we are. Buttons are back to normal. Yay! So those are the lookups, and then we've got a final order. So the final order, basically we go through the order. Remember the order was what the, the string versions here of what we want. So here are the string versions. We have to do this in two parts because FX hash wants to know what's going on. Yet here's where we're actually building. So we're we're tell, we're preparing the data ahead of time. It's sort of like could have, we wouldn't have even had to use strings if if we didn't have to tell FX hash something. But anyway, we're um, preparing the data up here, and then down below here we're about to use it. But basically, we want to prepare all nine of these: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. They're coming from order, that's the string, and we're basically looping through that and getting what type we want. That's that's our own thing. We can call that whatever we want, type. Zim loop is very handy. You can also loop through containers. Any containers you can loop through, we probably see that. Yeah, here we are looping through some stuff down below. How are we doing on time? Ooh, we're approaching an hour. Fun! Pretty simple, but we also talked about some other things that we're doing in Zim that are quite powerful. All right, so where'd we get to? We are on this part right here. Each time we get our type, and so we're asking the lookup right here to give us the object at that type. And we're pushing that into the final order. Which means the final order, that's sort of a weird thing. They'll look up at the type uh, into the final order, which is an array. So what does it do? I guess it makes a copy of the object as it gets put in there. It would almost be like I would have thought that as it pushed it onto the end, it would pull the object out of the first one, if it were in the first one, but it doesn't. Anyway, that gives us a... Um, a final order of these guys. Pup, 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 pup. Then we tile, oh, here's that series. We tile the final order in series because that like it's important that we keep that order. If we wanted to randomize it, it would just be, we'd pass in an array and that would be, that would be it randomized, but it would no longer be in the right order because it's randomized. So we're passing in a series to the tile. We're making it a three by three and 30 space in between, basically. Okay, and then we center that on the page and that gets centered on those rectangles that we made earlier. So the art, when we mouse down on the art, we are, wires have shells. Okay, so we made each shell, that's the outside wire, followed by an, the inside of the, of the wire. So normally we would just pull a random number or, or whatever uh, and do it, but we want to pull the random number so that we can use the random number twice, one for the backing and then one for the, the, the ring that is on top, which is going to be the child plus one, okay? So get child at is just getting a child at a container. That's, it goes all the way back to create JS code which goes all the way back to flash code, basically, which probably goes all the way back to director code. 
Um, all right, so we're changing the border color to a random color. So here we pluck a color out of all those colors. We darken it because this is the bottom ring. And then the top one, we just leave the color. And basically anytime we press here, we're changing the color of those wires at the top and the wire underneath the shell. We have to update the cache. If we don't update the cache, we won't see it. Ready? So we comment out, update the cache, and we would be going, okay, I'm pressing, I'm pressing, I'm pressing. Take a look, pressing, pressing, pressing. No colors. No, we didn't update the cache. So that's still the same image until the cache gets updated. So basically after we change the color, we make sure to update the cache on that. And now we can press, 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 press. And you can see that we're getting colors in the wires. If indeed you can see that at your video size or quality. <laughs> Hopefully you can. If we've turned this on, then we're going to um, turn this stuff on. So for instance, this is what it looks like when it's not turned on. the progress bar doesn't go, there's nothing checked, all the sliders are at zero, uh, numbers are at zero, etc. Pad is just at one. Probably could have made the pad. I think by default that's highlighted, but it doesn't doesn't have to be. You could turn that off as a, as a default. Anyway, yeah, we might have said set the current value of the pad to minus one. That's how you say there's no value. And oh, where was that? Sorry, selected index to minus one. Okay, and that would have started off the pad without any selected, might have looked better. Never thought of that. Recall, let's recall the NFT. Oh, maybe better yet, let's uh, let's let's mint a new generative token. We can resell these. <laughs> new, brand new ones with a fix. Yeah. Uh, anyway. So what are we doing to randomize all that stuff? Let's have a look. We're looping through art. So art is the new tile of all of our stuff. So art is this tile of tiles primarily. And if the items type, so we loop through art, art.loop, we get the item. We would also get what index number followed by a total. Uh, I think that's it for that, but we would have to put round brackets around that at all if we wanted those things. I don't think we need them though. So we're getting an item each time. If the type of it is a progress bar, then we're going to run it for a random time between 10 and 20 seconds. And false is turn, turn off, like go away once you run it. Progress bars aren't really supposed to be run. They're like they get, progress bars are usually for loading and we would load them in when we load images and stuff like that. And, and they run just kind of on their own, just fine. But we're wanting to demonstrate this progress bar. So we have to manually call the run method and we can run for a certain amount of seconds. This is basically saying don't hide it once it's done. So if we didn't have that, I think the default is to hide it. Shall we check? As if we get a progress bar, now we have to wait. So there's our random progress bar speed, yay. And by the way, the bar can also be a bar if we just said of type bar, and that disappeared. And this one will disappear too. So a bar would give a lot, uh, oh, of type rectangle, I think. And yeah, we decided with Zim to, instead of doing a rectangular progress bar, to make the default a round progress bar. And we scratched our head and said, can a bar be round? And we went, I uh, guess. <laughs> so that was our answer. Um, anyway, that's that one. If it's a pad, remember these are the ones that aren't tiled again. So if it's a pad, then we are setting the selected index to a random number. Um, could have probably said pad.num or something like that rather than hard coding 15. Yeah, that might have been better. Or item. Uh, Item dot total. I can't remember. Remember that we're working with Zim, so uh, I'm going to open up here and go to the docs and type in pad, pad, like that. Here's the pad. So those are all the parameters of the pad up there. But we're looking for a property of the pad. So that's down here. Type, selected index, text, selected label, color, buttons, labels, tabs, enabled. Really? There's no property that says how many things are in the tab? 
Oh, it's inherited. Uh, so it got inherited from... What is this anyway? Is it just a container? It's class extends a container. So it didn't extend a tile. Maybe we're missing that property. Interesting. Type selected index text selected label. How about that? Um, buttons, an array of the Zim buttons. So to get the number, I guess it would be buttons.length. So tabs.buttons.length. But still, it might have been nice to have. We could dig into the code. The code is actually in here and see. Maybe we just forgot to document it. Uh, it would have to be a getter setter. Uh, no, not necessarily. Well, yeah, it would be a getter setter, probably. A selected index enabled are the only getter setters in there. Okay, I guess we don't have. Oh, well, we've got a count. What's count doing? Count plus plus keys. Anyway, I can I can look at that later. This has been a long one for you, huh? Um, yeah, if that count were stored on the on the object, so uh, then we could receive you know tabs dot count or something like that. And where were we? So for that, I should probably just whip right on into um, Slack. So we have Zim Slack. Anything that, that comes up, well, I'll show you what that looks like. Desktop reveal, Slack. So here's Slack and requests. So where's requests? Release requests. Uh, add count or total or num i'm not sure what would be the most consistent thing there to pad for um well i don't know what that is there we go and that way it's it's been documented as we think about it i won't forget later all right so anyway that's pad <laughs> hence it's hard coded <laughs> But we could have said item.buttons.link. So if the item type is a tile, then we're going to do this stuff. We're going to loop through the tile. So if the item's a tile, we loop through it each time we get the component. So C here stands for the component. If the type is checkbox, we're going to randomly half the time check it. So this would be check it 90% of the time. This would be check it 10% of the time. And you would see it be checked less. That's half the time. Uh, set the selected index of the stepper to a random number of 10. We could have used the length of the stepper if we wanted to, or the length of the component, C dot, whatever, I don't know. Um, but by default, it was zero to 10. Uh, actually, that's interesting. Would that ever be set at 10? We did see it set at 10 sometimes. Um, I think ran, oh yeah, ran, ran 10 is 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So it includes 10. And then if it's the dial or the slider, then set the current value to the max or random up to the max. And if it's an indicator, then select the selected index to a random of five of them. There are, there's probably some way to get a length of the indicator too, if, rather than hard code it. But. That's it. So that's what we've done there to get a variety of different settings. And then we add, we grab a pick, we grab the noise. The noise, by the way, we passed in up here. Have to, but usually we preload. So this is, the, we're fitting it at this dimension. Should have shown you this right in the very beginning. Uh, these, This is the color. Black is the color of it. Dark is the outer. This is dark. I want to set that to darker. I think when I set it to darker, it, it conflicted with this. It made it look like these two aren't the same level and it wasn't quite as nice. So I dropped it to, or lightened it to dark. And anyway, it's fine. Uh, but there we are passing what assets. We could pass in an array of these things. They could be fonts. They could be sounds. It could be text, uh, JSON. We're doing JPEGs. And then the directory they're in, optional. Well, since we put it in directory, we need it. And then down below, we're loading in the pick right here. 
Uh, if we didn't do that, it would lazy load that, but it might have, um, I don't know, late, uh, I, I mean, if we lazy load, it's not going to take 1.5 seconds, but whatever. This is making sure that it's loaded. We grab the pick. We're rotating that a random amount. So even though it's noise, may as well make it seem a little bit different. So randomly, that noise will be rotated, and that makes it look a little bit different. Could have possibly scaled some random, but we're centering it. We are changing the alpha down. This is what the noise looks like, by the way, if we set it to one. We also say don't make the mouse try and hit that. So there's our picture of noise. And watch as we rotate it, that picture looks slightly different because oh, there's that little black speck on the left-hand side. A refresh here. We got it on the left-hand side again. A refresh here. It's not on the left-hand side. It's up there. So whatever for the discerning. And let's undo that at 0.3. And we're back to applying just a little bit of noise on that to make it seem like brushed, brushed metal or what have you. That's it. And running the FX hash preview. Yay! Oh my god, I did not expect that to take an hour. That was a lot of stuff in there. By the way, if you're watching these, you're always welcome to pause them and come back to them later. <laughs> Hopefully you come back to them later. And uh, we'd love to meet with you in Discord or Slack. Be happy to talk to you there. Come on in. You should check out Zim. Uh, this has been Making Interactive NFTs. And I am Dr. Abstract. Have a great day or night. And like I said, come visit us. We would love to see you there. Cheers.